historically a kind of ability or practical capacity. Not surprisingly, Kant's specific conception of positive freedom is normative. Being free is being able to adopt normative statuses, paradigmatically being able to commit oneself to undertake responsibilities. It's the capacity to bind oneself by conceptual norms in judgment and in action. This is exercising a certain kind of inferentially articulated authority, a kind that comes with a correlative rational responsibility to have reasons for one's endorsements, one's exercise of that authority. To use an example suggested by Kant's metaphor in Vasistav Clairon, consider what happens when young people achieve their legal majority. Suddenly they can enter into contracts and so legally bind themselves. Hence they can do such things as borrow money, start businesses, take out mortgages. This change of normative status involves a huge increase in positive freedom. The difference between discursive creatures and non-discursive ones is likewise to be understood in terms of the sort of normative positive freedom exhibited by concept users. On this Kantian account, being free is not only compatible with being constrained by norms, it consists in being constrained by norms. And since the norms, remember, are conceptual norms, their content is articulated by reasons. So positive normative freedom is also the capacity to act for reasons. Not in the causal sense that if we trace back the antecedents of your act, we'll find your acknowledgement of a reason, but in the normative sense of the ability to bind oneself by norms that make one liable to assessment as to one's reasons. Whatever made you act that way, you've made yourself liable to assessment as to what your reasons were. This constellation of ideas about normativity, reason, and freedom is, I think, what Heidegger meant when he talked about the dignity and spiritual greatness of German idealism. And I think it's a constellation of ideas that we're still only beginning to digest. One of the permanent intellectual achievements and great philosophical legacies of the Enlightenment was the development of secular conceptions of legal, political, and moral normativity. In the place of traditional appeals to authority derived ultimately from divine commands, thought of as ontologically based on the status of the heavenly Lord as the creator of those he commands, Enlightenment philosophers conceived of kinds of responsibility and authority, commitment and entitlement, that derived rather from the practical attitudes of human beings. So for instance, in social contract theories of political obligation, Normative statuses are thought of as instituted by the intent of individuals to bind themselves, thought of there on the model of promising or entering a contract. But the point I care about is that political authority is there understood as ultimately derived from its, perhaps only implicit, acknowledgement by those over whom it's exercised. Following Rousseau, Kant radicalizes this line of thought, developing on its basis a new criterion of demarcation for the normative, a criterion of demarcation in terms of autonomy. This is the idea that we're genuinely normatively constrained only by rules that we've constrained ourselves by, that we adopt and acknowledge as binding on us. On this line, the difference between non-normative compulsion and normative authority is that we're genuinely normatively responsible only to what we acknowledge as authoritative. In the end, Kant, like Rousseau thinks, we can only bind ourselves in the sense that we're only really bound by the results of exercises of our freedom, self-bindings, commitments that we have undertaken. The acknowledgement of authority may be merely implicit, as when Kant argues that in acknowledging others as concept users, we're implicitly also acknowledging a commitment not to treat their concept using activities as mere means to our own ends. So he thinks there can be background commitments that are part of the implicit structure of rationality and normativity as such. Still, even in these cases, the source of our normative statuses is understood to lie in our normative attitudes. Merely natural creatures are bound only by rules in the form of laws whose bindingness is not at all conditioned on their acknowledgement of those rules as binding on them. But normatively free, rational creatures are also bound by norms which is to say by rules that are binding only insofar as they're acknowledged as binding by those creatures. As Kant says, we're bound not just by rules, but by our conceptions of rules. <coughs>
And I think it's important to notice that this picture requires the strict conceptual separation of the content of norms from their normative force. The Kant Rousseau autonomy understanding of the nature of the force or bindingness of norms, the criterion of demarcation of the normative in terms of autonomy, in terms of binding being self-binding, it means that only we can normatively bind ourselves. It's in the end up to us what we're committed to and responsible for. But if not only the normative force, but also the contents of those commitments were, were up to us, then to paraphrase Wittgenstein, whatever seems right to us would be right. And talk of what's right or wrong could get no intelligible grip. That is, no norm would have been brought to bear, no genuine commitment undertaken. <coughs> Put another way, autonomy, binding oneself by a norm, rule, or law, has to have two components, corresponding to autos and nomos. One must bind oneself, but one must also bind oneself. And if not only that one is bound by a certain norm, but also what that norm involves, what's correct or incorrect according to it, is up to the one endorsing it, then the notion that one is bound, that a distinction has been put in place between what's correct or incorrect according to the norm, goes missing. That is to say, the attitude dependence of normative force, which is what the autonomy thesis asserts, is in principle intelligible only in a context in which the boundaries of the content are not, up, are not in the same way attitude dependent. What I acknowledge as constraining me, and by that acknowledgement make into a normative constraint on me, in the sense of opening myself up to the normative assessments according to it, cannot be up to me in the same sense, in the same way as whether I'm bound is. This is just a criterion of adequacy of making the notion of normative constraint intelligible. Kant secures this necessary division of labor by appeal to concepts as rules that determine what's a reason for what, and so, as we'll see, what falls under the concept so articulated. His picture of empirical activity as consisting in the application of concepts, of judging and acting as consisting in endorsements of propositions and maxims, strictly separates the contents endorsed from the acts of endorsing them. The latter is our responsibility. The former is not. The judging or acting empirical consciousness, for Kant, always already has available a stable of completely determinate concepts. Its function is to choose among them, picking which ones to invest its authority in by applying them to objects, and hence which conceptually articulated responsibility to assume, which discursive commitments to undertake. Judging that what I see up ahead is a dog, applying that concept in perceptual judgment, pulling that concept off the shelf uh, of available ones, may initially be successfully integratable into my transcendental unity of apperception, in that it's not incompatible with any of my other commitments. But subsequent empirical experience may normatively require me to withdraw that characterization, put that concept back on the shelf, pull another one off, and apply instead, say, the concept fox. That's my activity and my responsibility. But what other judgments are compatible with something being a dog or a fox is not up to me. It's settled by the contents of those concepts, by the particular rules I can choose to apply to bind myself by. In taking this line, Kant is once again adopting a characteristic rationalist order of explanation. It starts with the idea that empirical experience presupposes the availability of determinate concepts. For apperception, awareness in the sense required for sapience, awareness that can have cognitive significance, is judgment and judgment is the application of concepts. Even classification of something particular as something as of some general kind counts as awareness only if the general kind one applies is a concept. That is, something whose application can both serve as and stand in need of reasons constituted by the application of other concepts. When an iron pipe rusts in the rain, it is in some sense classifying its environment as being of a certain general kind but it is in no interesting sense aware of it. The rationalist thought is one must always already have concepts in order to be aware of anything at all. Kant, I've said, understands apperception, what the transcendental unity of apperception is a unity of, which is to say judgment, in normative terms, 